Associate Professor Jackie Centre is the lab head of clinical studies and epidemiology. You know, there's one word I couldn't say when I came here, and I'm still having trouble with it. Anyway, uh, so Associate Professor Jackie Centre qualified as an endocrinologist in 1993. She obtained a Master of Epidemiolo Epidemiology, <laughs> sorry Jackie, in 1995 and a PhD in 1999. She's been working on clinical and other studies related to osteoporotic fracture and its outcomes for over 18 years and has been one of the principal researchers in the Dubbo osteoporosis study that Andrew just mentioned, which she's been going for over 25 years now. She's pioneered work on consequences of fracture including the high risk of refracture and premature mortality that has actually resulted in international collaborations involving investigators from several large studies throughout Europe, Canada and the US. Are you ready to roll, Jackie? I think so. Please put your hands together to welcome Jackie this morning. Thanks very much for that introduction, Carol, and uh, thank you all for allowing me to speak today. So I'd like to just run through briefly a little bit about osteoporosis and then a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing and how that impacts upon uh, how we can treat osteoporosis and how we can prevent it. So what is osteoporosis? Well, it's a disease characterised by low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue that leads to enhanced bone fragility and therefore an increase in fracture risk. And if you look to the left, you can see uh, what looks like normal bone with nice, firm and large struts here, a bit like if you were to design a building, you would have uh, the, the pillars and then you'd have across the pillars to make them stronger uh, horizontal struts. And this is what happens in osteoporosis. So the bones become thinner. Some of these horizontal struts, as you can see here, actually break. And therefore, if you were to fall over or there was to be a, a heavier load put upon this bone, you could see how it might eat more easily crush. Now, how many people have osteoporosis? Well, we know that about almost 5 million Australians have osteoporosis, and that's estimated to grow to over 6 million by 2022. And around 6 million Australians currently have osteopenia, which is where the bones are not quite as thin as osteoporosis, but they're heading on their way down there. Now, what used to be thought, and certainly when I started research, was that osteoporosis was a woman's disease. We all know that as, we, as people get older, and you'd expect to see people become slightly stooped and bent over, and that's the typical picture in everyone's mind of osteoporosis. Well, actually, 23% of pe people with osteoporosis are men. And if you think about all the fractures that occur, out of every three fractures, two would occur in women and one in a man. So by no means is it a woman's disease and that's one of the things we actually found from our Dubbo study. Now just very briefly, because it was mentioned, the Dubbo Osteoporosis Epidemiology Study started in 1989 and is ongoing. And we recruited at that stage over 2,000 women and almost 2,000 men and we've been following them every couple of years to look for risk factors for osteoporosis, risk factors for fracture, and also the outcomes of fracture. And the study has been expanded. We're now uh, on the about to sort of look at some of the, gen the genomic capabilities that we've got here now at the Garvin. <coughs> but this was ba built on the basis of this study, where we get a number of measures about these people, and I'll talk to you about some of these, what medication they're on, certain lifestyle factors, what their height and weight are, how strong their bones are by a bone density measurement. And we are able, fortunately by its relative isolation, to collect all the fractures that occur in Dubbo and also to follow that up by collecting all the deaths that occur. 
Now most of us think, or most of us used to think of osteoporosis and fracture as particularly a hip fracture or a wrist fracture or a spine fracture. But in fact, any bone in the body, apart from the skull, which is very dense, fortunately, uh, can, that can break, can be an osteoporotic fracture. So it can be the upper arm, it can be the ribs, it can be the pelvis, even the hand, anywhere in the legs, and even the ankle and feet. And fractures occurring in virtually every bone can be an osteoporotic fracture. And what that means is it's a fracture occurring after a simple fall. If you ask yourself, if I were 10 and I fell over like this, would I expect that bone to break? And if the answer is no, then it is probably an osteoporotic fracture that you have. So what do we know about the incidence of osteoporosis? And this comes straight from the Dubbo Osteoporotic Study. Um, if you look here, this graph here on the left is women and on the right is men. In green here are hip fractures. And if you focus on those, and across the x-axis is age. So we go from 60 to 69 up to 80 plus and exactly the same in the men. And if you look here, if, if you follow the pointer, that the green uh, bar here is hip fractures, so not that many in, uh, when you're 60 to 69, but they rapidly increase, particularly at 80 plus. And you can see how the incidence of hip fractures increases, particularly as you get older. And it's exactly the same pattern as in men. As I mentioned before, not as many fractures occur in men, but for out of every three fractures, one of those will be in a man. In orange, you can see vertebral fractures, that's spine fractures. And they're actually more frequent in the younger people, but they also increase exponentially with age in women and men. But what hadn't been realised until very recently is that if you look at all the other fractures that I mentioned in the rest of the body, they actually occur in the younger population in a much higher uh, frequency. And they remain relatively, they increase a bit as you get older, but they remain relatively stable. And you can see how important these fractures are because they dominate the number of fractures, both in women and men. Now, you may say, well, that's okay. So I get a fracture of my arm and I get it fixed. What does that matter? Well, it does matter and I'll show you. Once you have your first fracture, I'm going to show you what happens to your risk of having another fracture. So here are all fractures put together. And in pink is women. Not very sexist here, you might say. <laughs> and in green is men. So for the first fracture, as I've mentioned before, there's more fractures occur in women than in men. Okay? Now, and here we've got again across the x-axis your age range. So you fewer fractures in the younger people and it increases as you get older. But once you've had your first fracture, this is your risk of a second fracture. So you can see for every age group, your risk increases at least two to twofold and actually fourfold for men. And what's very interesting is that once a man has had their first fracture, their risk of a second fracture is exactly the same as that of a woman who's also had their first fracture. So the protective factors in men are no longer there once they've had their first fracture. They've shown that their bones are weak enough to break again. And we know that the risk of another fracture is particularly high in the first five years after your first fracture. And the important other thing is that once you've had even a fracture of your arm, your risk of a more major fracture like a hip fracture is increased by at least twofold. So that whatever the first fracture is, even if it seems to be a not significant fracture, it is a signal <coughs> that you're at risk of having another fracture which could be a very major fracture. So we know that the increased risk of another fracture follows all low trauma fractures, that it's greatest in the first five to 10 years following a fracture. The relative risk is higher in men, so that once they've had their first fracture, their risk of a second fracture is exactly the same as a woman. 
And in fact, the risk of a second fracture for a woman or a man is equivalent to that of the risk of an initial fracture for a woman who's 10 years older or for a man who's 20 years older. Now, one of the other things we found in the Dubbo study is that particularly as you're getting older, the, you, you, you don't do as well after a fracture, or at least some people don't do as well after a fracture, and that compared to an age-matched person of the same uh, age and sex, you don't live as long. And if you can imagine that in the white here is the normal mortality of a woman at a particular age between 60 to 74. So they start off alive up here, and then by the time 20 years have passed, 40% will have died. And that's just because they get older and you die, and that's sort of the population age. We know that men die um, a bit more, have a higher death rate than women in general, and so 20 years after an equivalent aged man, we'd only, we'd have about 50% who would have died. But if you just focus on the green line, that's the mortality of people who've had hip fractures. And you can see that within, say, 10 years, while only 20% of the normal population will have died, 60% of those who have had a hip fracture will have died. And these intermediate colours here are for the other major fractures, not the wrist fracture, not the foot fracture, not the ankle fracture, but other major fractures, including fractures of the upper arm and fractures of the spine and multiple ribs. And it's probably more clearly demonstrated here in the older age group, where the white line again is the population. And obviously, if you start off at 75, 20 years later, the majority of people will have died by 95. But compared with that population, those who've had hip mm -hmm. fractures do dramatically worse, but all these other fractures, and this time even including the minor fractures, probably because of their risk of having another fracture, um, and it's exactly the same in the men, in fact the men do worse than the women, have a higher mortality compared with the population. And in fact, if you just look at numbers, to make it easier, the mortality is roughly twofold of that of someone of the same age and sex. Worse, of course, for hip fractures, not as much for some of the other minor fractures. So what can we do about it? I'm not going to leave you on a low note. <laughs> There's a lot we can do about it, and that's what's really exciting in the field that I'm in, because there is so much research and um, so many new medications and things coming along. So how could you assess what your fracture risk is? It depends on your age, as I've told you. As you get older, your risk of fracture increases. It depends on your sex, particularly for your first fracture. Women are at higher risk. Obviously, from what I've told you, whether or not you've had a low trauma fracture in the past, because that increases your risk of another fracture. Whether you fall, most fractures occur after a fall. You have to have very, very weak bones for it to fracture without a fall. Um, weight is important. The lighter you are, the more likely if you fall, you're going to fracture. And that's partly because you don't have as much padding. Um, obviously, the thinner your bones are, the more likely you are to fracture. If there's a family history of osteoporosis or fracture, because up to about 70% of how thick or thin your bones are is related to genetic factors. So if there's a strong family history of osteoporosis, you need to consider that you might be at risk. Certain medications particularly increase risk of fracture, like particularly steroids, if you're on prednisone. Um, a number of hormonal factors, so low estrogen levels in women or low testosterone levels in men. Um, if people have had for instance, anorexia nervosa at a young age, where that's where people get very thin and lose their periods, um, particularly for women. That means that they have had a period of life without estrogen, which we know is very important for bones. A number of other medical conditions, including certain lung diseases, certain liver disease, 
certain uh, hormonal diseases such as an overactive thyroid, for instance, and lifestyle factors, excessive smoking particularly, excessive alcohol intake are all risk factors for fracture, and of course, um, how much calcium you've uh, ingested. Now, what can we do about it? Well, it's actually very simple to get an estimate of what, how thick or thin your bones are. And we use a um, DEXA scanner or densitometer. It looks a little bit like this. It's not at all claustrophobic. It takes about 15 minutes to scan both your spine and hip. It's very safe. It's, there's virtually no radiation. If just as much radiation as you get from walking around the streets. Mm -hmm. So you could have one of these, you know, almost as often as you like, mm -hmm. except it would cost you a bit much. <laughs> um, although it is not that expensive. And it is the best estimate that we had, have at present of your current and future fracture risk. And here you can see that we get an image of your spine. These are the individual vertebrae. It's the lumbar spine, so it's the lower spine and also of your hip, and this is an image of someone's hip. And then we can estimate from this the amount of bone per unit area in any part of the skeleton. And so obviously the higher bone density, the stronger the bone. And this just gives, don't worry about these numbers, but this, you, you, if you have one of these scans, you get a, a printout that looks a little bit like this, where this bar, this is bone density on the y-axis, and age on the x-axis. And this bar represents the general population. So you start off when you're younger with a high bone density and then as you get particularly past the age of 50, your bone density starts to drop. In women, it's related very much to the menopause and losing estrogen, but it also occurs in men. And then you generally continue to lose bone density, not at such a rapid rate, but it continues to decline. And you'll get a little square or circle or however it happens to print out of where you fit in that picture. So you can tell immediately, is, am I about right for my age? Uh, which tells you if you've got particular um, factors that, uh, that you know, put you outside. For instance, if you were down here, you would know that you're at particularly high risk. But then we compare you to a young person to so how far below a young person you are to determine what your absolute risk fra fra fracture risk is. Now, as you may have gathered, there's a lot of risks for fracture. So how, given all this information, we can get our bone density, but how can we try and personalise what the individual risk is for you? And that's one of the things we've been trying to do from the Dubbo study. We know there are a lot of um, bone-related factors uh, including the bone mineral density, including whether you lose bone. Some people lose bone more, more rapidly, other people lose bone more slowly. Geometry of bone plays a part. Certain other material and mineral properties of bone, which we can't assess without actually doing a bone biopsy, which we do very rarely. Uh, we know that a lot of fall-related factors are important. With how many falls you have had in the past, how stable you are, how weak your muscles are, whether you're likely to trip over things, what your visual acuity is. We know that a lot of lifestyle factors are important, how much alcohol and smoking you have, what your diet is like, diseases, medication, whether or not you've had a prior fracture and what type of prior fracture, and certain things that you can't do anything about, really, how old you are, what your sex is. Unfortunately, you can't choose your parents, so you can't change your genes and height and weight. And what we've developed in Dubbo is a simple risk calculator where we've taken the factors that are the most important in all of these and put them together to give you a risk for fracture. And in fact, what it involves is an estimate of your bone density, the number of prior falls you've had in the last year, what your age is, what your sex is, and the number of prior fractures. And if you look at that, this you can get to this website from the Garvin Institute or you can just Google fracture risk calculator and it takes about two minutes to fill out. You don't need your name, you need your sex. You can fill in how old you are, whether you've had any fractures since the age of 50, the number of falls you've had. If you have a bone density, what the T-score is, which your doctor will know, 
if you've had one. If you haven't, you can still put in your weight and get a fairly good estimate because weight is a very strong predictor of bone density. And then you have to tick the disclaimer box and it comes up with a percentage risk of your risk for a fracture. So this person who was 75 uh, who hadn't had any um, prior fractures has a five year risk of any fracture of about 11.7% of about 12%. And although it doesn't quite fit, you get also here an estimate of what the P of what the government decides has decided on their PBS allow recommendations as to what would be reimbursable by Medicare. So what would make sense to reimburse, in other words, if you're weighing up risk and benefit, where it's beneficial to, to reimburse. But that that just gives you an idea of what your risk for a fracture is over the next five or ten years. Now what can you do about it? Well, there's a number of lifestyle factors that we know are important and that everyone, all of us, should be doing, including how much calcium you have, what your vitamin D is, some exercise, particularly to improve muscle strength and balance, stop smoking, moderate alcohol intake, and obviously things you can do to prevent falls. And I'll talk very briefly about calcium. So how much calcium should I have? You should, for all adults, have at least 1,000 milligrams of calcium. And if you've got osteoporosis or you're a postmenopausal woman, it should probably be about 1,200 milligrams. And it's very easy to estimate how much calcium you have. If you think of a serve as being 300 milligrams, then a glass of milk is a serve, a couple of good slices of cheese is a serve, 200 gram tub of yogurt is a serve, small can of sardines or a small can of salmon with the bones is a serve of calcium. You get a bit of calcium in other general foods, so leafy green vegetables, but you need to have about a kilo of broccoli to get you a serve of calcium. And that's a bit much for most of us. Uh, so most of it does come in dairy. Hard tofu has some calcium, is, is quite high in calcium. And certain nuts, particularly almonds and sesame seeds. So pr if you're having a general healthy diet, you'll probably make up about a serve. So that leaves you with needing two to three other serves of calcium from calcium rich foods. And if you can't get enough from your diet, then it's reasonable to take a calcium supplement. We'd only recommend probably one tablet unless you really can't get any calcium at all from your diet. Um, but if you can from your diet, I always think it's, it's better to do it naturally rather than to have to take tablets. Vitamin D is also important. It helps the body absorb calcium. How much do you need? Well, you don't need a lot. In our climate, it obviously varies a lot by where you live as to how much exposure, you know, what the UV radiation is. But if you expose uh, your arms, neck, and face to the sun, you need about 10 to 15 minutes, and that's not in the heat of the day, so avoiding between 11 and 3 in summer. But you need longer in winter, so you need about 30 to 40 minutes in winter. And obviously, if you're in Tasmania, you need more, and if you're in Queensland, you need less. If you're dark-skinned, you don't absorb vitamin D as, as readily. Um, and unfortunately, as you get older, we're not as good as converting vitamin D from the sunlight into usable vitamin D. But it's a very simple test to have. You can measure it. You can measure your vitamin D by a simple blood test. And if your levels are low, then it's very easy to take a supplement, either by a tablet, and they're small tablets, not like the calcium tablets, which are you know, a bit like uh, horse tablets, but um, they're, they're either by a tablet or a liquid. So it's, it's very simple and it's something that um, can easily be done. But also particularly, as well as absorbing calcium, it does have a, an important role to play in keeping your muscles strong. And if you're very low in vitamin D, you are at increased risk of falls because of weak muscles. Exercise can help a bit. You can't, it's very hard to do exercise studies, so it's hard to, it's because people who like doing exercise will do it, and those who don't like doing exercise won't. 
But there certainly is some evidence that particularly um, balance exercises, things like Tai Chi, um, Pilates, yoga, that sort of thing to try and improve your balance is important. And resistance exercises to improve muscle strength, they're particularly important. And they're safe to do. Mm. You know, um, if you've got very low bone density at the spine, for instance, you should not be bending down, picking up heavy weights, because that's putting a great load on your spine. But there are resistance exercises that you can do that help strengthen muscles in general. So the good news is we have lots of treatment for osteoporosis. And depending on, we, we believe that you should have, do lifestyle things like calcium and vitamin D and um, not smoking and moderate alcohol intake, that should occur all through your life. But there's a number of treatments that we've got that you can change at any time. At, at earlier on, it might be appropriate to use hormone therapy or synthetic estrogen receptor modulators or drugs like tibolone um, around the time of the menopause. We have bisphosphonates. We have denosumab. You may have heard of it. That's an injection. Bisphosphonates are um, weekly or monthly tablets. Denosumab is an injection that you can give once every six months. PTH or Forteo is, is really for those with much more severe osteoporosis. Uh, but, and that's a, a, a course of an 18-month of daily injections and obviously vitamin D. But all of these treatments decrease the risk of fracture by about a half. So they have a significant effect in decreasing fracture risk. And what's very exciting is that with some evidence from our study, from the Dubbo study and from other studies, that the treatments, particularly bisphosphonates, may not only decrease fracture risk, but may also improve survival. Now, as yet, we don't know how this might be the case or what the mechanism is. And part of the work that I'm really excited about at the moment, part of the big international collaborations, is to try and look at the relationship between fracture and survival, and particularly the effect of osteoporotic treatment on survival, and how that may help improve survival. But this, this is from the Dubbo study. The white curve in the middle here were, was that is a general population again. The red curve were people who had fractures who uh, were on no treatment. And you can see they do worse. There's a, there's a gap here. By the time, by 15 years, 50% 50 of them have died compared with about 30% of the general population. But in green, and again, you know, we didn't have large numbers, which is why we need to make sure that this truly exists, but um, were the people who were on bisphosphonate therapy, on treatment for osteoporosis, and their survival was back to that of the general population, which is absolutely incredible. Um, but there has been a randomised control study that has also found that um, it was a study in hip fractures, but people who um, were on treatment had a 30% improved survival um, compared with those who are not on treatment, which was not due just to a reduction in other fractures. So there's something else going on as well. And just also to leave you on a positive note, we're working, I'm working in collaboration with one of the other basic researchers here, Paul Baldock, in, um, in our bone group, who's been looking at how the brain can actually control bone in mice. Absolutely fascinating um, work, but there is a lot of evidence now that there is a very strong control of how, how, how thick your bones are, how strong your bones are by the brain. And we've designed some studies in humans to actually see if this pathway exists in humans as well, which would give us a huge novel ways of treating osteoporosis. So I'll leave you on that positive note. These are some of the wonderful people in Dubbo who've helped us with the study.